<laughs> All right, let's see if this thing is working. So stream should be up. Uh, let's have a look at what YouTube told me. Uh, 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 uh. Right, so basically my software tells me that I'm recording. Uh, this is the first time that I'm trying to do this through YouTube as well. And the effects are so-so because YouTube doesn't seem to recognize that I'm recording right now. Anyway, um, let's start and I'll see uh, how we fare in a moment. YouTube might not pick this up, but hopefully uh, this will get uploaded to uh, YouTube once it's done. So either way, uh, hopefully we, I will be successful with this. So um, yeah, welcome to well, my, my beautiful people. Welcome to uh, the next episode of, uh, of the Contact Lost uh, Late Night Week uh, stream. Uh, this is my space. <laughs> I record, I'm Tweak, and I record stuff uh, late at night or late in the evening for your viewing pleasure. Um, usually this is the stuff that we, that, that, that doesn't really make the cut into the main Contact Lost episode. Although recently you might have seen that um, actually there are more late night weeks released than contact lost episodes there is a good reason for that and and this is that we are very ambitious as contact lost uh, joker and i uh joker wants to participate in multiple tournaments so uh, so we really at times we find it difficult to um to find common time to record uh contact lost episodes and sometimes um you know we want to invite guests but then the guests also have a difficult time joining because they are preparing for tournaments, etc., etc. So there is a lot of stuff going on. Sometimes it's just easier for me to uh, record something alone, and uh, that's what's happening today. However, this week definitely uh, we will have a treat for you on Thursday, and I will be releasing like a, a note about that um, soon. On Thursday we will have Pumba joining us because, well, spoiler alert, last weekend there was a, uh, a Polish team championship. Uh, there were, I think, 18 teams of five players and Pumba's team took the first place together with Vladi, my son and some other guys. So we will have Pumba uh, over at, the, at Contact Lost to discuss uh, how it went, to discuss um, their army composition, how they built their army, etc., etc. All the good stuff uh, about team tournaments, because this probably was the last opportunity to have like a um, WTC practice in a tournament setting. So, uh, so really, a lot of interesting stuff that the national team was testing um, some 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 lists that they didn't even share in uh, in tabletop. Uh, sorry, tabletop in um, uh, Tourney Keeper. So um, yeah, so hopefully Pumba can you know tell us some smaller and bigger secrets uh, about what they took and what they wanted to test, or maybe not. We'll see. I haven't asked him yet. Anyway, um, today. We focus on a new topic. Uh, we I want to continue the the topic of tactics and you know those tactics one on one. Um, the target for this, so I mean the target audience for this are probably people who still struggle to you know find themselves in the game to be successful in the game for various reasons it's also people who um you know maybe are coming back after a while and to the game and want to enjoy it but find it difficult because the rules bloat is uh, so big and there are so many things to rem that you have to remember that um it's simply difficult to get back and i'm inspired uh, this week i'm inspired by my good friend elf who came back from his military service after 13 months. And when we started catching up last week and we discussed, uh, you know, we started talking about the game, uh, what do you do in command phase and movement phase and so on, he looked at me, you know, shocked and said, like, what's command phase? <laughs> so uh, actually there are people who, um, who do struggle, who, who can't remember shit. And, uh, and these series are for them. 
Um, I hope that everyone can find something useful in the, uh, useful in those series. I hope that um, you know mm, you you'll let me know if this kind of stuff is not useful to you, or uh, maybe you can you can contribute and tell me something more uh, about what we're recording. However, uh, you know, let's start. Let's look at today's topic. Today's topic will be uh, apping your primary and secondary objective game. Last week, we did an episode on list building. If you haven't seen it, do check it out because I will be mentioning a lot of what I spoke in the previous episode in this episode as well. It's a series after all, so those um, those episodes are interconnected, so it's good to catch up if you haven't had the opportunity. Before we start, if you like what I'm doing, if you like Contact Lost as a whole, what, uh, what myself and Joker are doing, Please like and subscribe. This will help us grow, reach new audiences, etc., etc. I feel really bad when I spam those videos and so on on different discords and Facebook groups and so on. It would be nicer to just organically grow through likes and subscribes. So please help us that way. Um, yeah, let's move on. Let's move on to the presentation. I will do something... I hope interesting today. Um, for the people who, who listen on Spotify and so on, um, you might miss out a little bit on a piece of demonstration that I will try to do later on because I will try to show you some stuff on TTS as well. Let's see how how uh, how this pans out. So yeah, basically, um, let's start. So, um, or maybe before I move to the to the slide. So basically uh, picking um, the, the proper secondaries in your game and, and uh, playing properly your primary game is something that can make or break your uh, your tournament, for example. If, if, if you plan to play a tournament, if you do those things wrongly, you probably won't, won't have a good time. Um, the, you, you need to understand how, how primary is done. You need to understand which secondaries play to your advantage, which secondaries are probably not the best for your army. And in order to do that, I will repeat the same thing that I, that I said last week. If you want to be successful at tournaments, you need to do your research. And research includes many things. First of all, it will include what tournament you will be playing at, what rule set you will be playing, what terrain you will be playing, uh, what the meta for that tournament is. So, you know, what armies can you expect? What armies should you not expect? Um, your list building will be affected by that. And the way your list is structured, it's going to affect the secondaries uh, that you pick. So things to consider about the primary and secondary game. First of all, list building and playing the mission intertwine. This is a fact, undeniable fact. Um, if you want to be successful at scoring primaries, you need to take a bunch of things that I will talk about in a moment into account. Um, and the same goes for the secondaries game. I spoke about that in the previous episode. If you want to be successful at scoring certain secondaries, you need to know the wording of those secondaries. And by wording, I mean very often it, it mentions what kind of unit can do that secondary. If it's a character, if it's infantry, if it's a biker, if it's a psyker, and so on and so on. So what you include in your list will define what secondaries you can and what secondaries you cannot pick. For example, if you take a psyker, this already does away with Abhor the Witch because Abhor the Witch, um, that secondary's uh, wording says that you cannot have psykers in your list. That's a very basic example that I hope the majority of people know about, but it serves the role perfectly to demonstrate what I mean. So list building is extremely important and how you build your list, as I said, depends on a bunch of factors. Uh, and eventually it will also affect your primary and secondary game. Um, when building your list, you should already know uh, what play style is best for your army. Is it an aggressive play style when you want to be on your uh, enemy's half, or as we will later call it, in your enemy's territory? Or do you want to play a more passive style and choose secondaries that either tell you to survive or tell you to maybe stay away from uh, your enemy because there are, for example, some um, psychic actions that allow you to, be, or well, that can be performed from 24 inches away or something like that. So this is more of a safe play style. There are also secondaries 
I'm not going to go very much into those faction-specific secondaries, just because the rule of thumb is that they are pretty weak. So I'm going to focus on the generic ones. Of course, there are uh, secondaries from, from codices and so on that are ex extremely strong, or if not strong, very easy to do, or something that you will naturally pick because it fits the army's playstyle. But they are a minority, and I think I could use you know the fingers of my palm to count these that are actually worth taking. Um, however, yeah, the, the playstyle of your army uh, affects your list, it affects the secondaries. What else? Research the rule pack, as I said. So rules pack of the tournament uh, to know which missions will be played. This is extremely important because you need to know, first of all, what missions, because missions very often define tables. Uh, tables meaning terrain. So again, you need to know which terrain pack will be played. I mentioned that in the list building episode as well, whether it's GW terrain, whether it's WTC terrain, player plays terrain, you need to know which one of those that will be to plan ahead how your army is going to move, how your army is going to interact with the table. Um, so you need to take that into account. And then also uh, when we think about primary and secondary um, uh, picks, it is also important to know because certain secondaries cannot be done by certain unit types, for example. Realize the strengths and weaknesses of your army before sending in your list. I mean, it's it's a no-brainer, really, but it's something that you need to do in advance. And this comes with time, this comes with experience, this comes with uh, watching other people play, this comes from repetitions and so on. So you will know exactly what your army can and cannot do. If you have a Dark Angels Terminator spam, this is an army that is slow. It's not going to be fantastic in score at scoring engage on all fronts, which ex well demands from you to be in all four quarters of the table. If your um, opponent allows you to, if your opponent like exposes himself and you can charge him, and then you know using all the pile ins and consolidations and so on, you can get into his quarter. That's fantastic. But let's not assume that your opponent is going to make mistakes. Let's assume that you're going to be playing against someone capable. If you're playing against someone capable, he will know your strengths and your weaknesses and will know how to take advantage of your army. You need to do the same. Have a list of secondaries you can score before you attend the tournament. Again, this is the bit of preparation that you can do. This is the bit of research that you can do yourself. It does not require... Um, knowing who your opponents are to know what your armies can do. So um, go through the list of secondaries in chapter approved if you still struggle with choosing secondaries. Don't ever wait for the tournament to come and then you open the book and hmm, which one should I choose? Because one, it's a waste of time. Two, it's really down to bad decisions. If you do this under the pressure of time, um, you will make a bad, bad, bad decision, I'm, I'm sure. So always have a list of those secondaries that your army is good at. Those could be three or four. It doesn't have to be more, but three or four is okay because usually in those three or four, there are two that you can pick almost immediately. And then there is one that will be dependent on what your enemy is bringing. So it could be no prisoners. If he brings a lot of little guys, it could be bring it down. If he brings a lot of monsters or big guys, it could be abhor the witch if your enemy is psyker heavy and so on and so on but three four maybe five this is definitely something that you can bring to the tournament like a little list of the things that you can do little notes also if you write them down you will memorize them better so definitely a piece of preparation that can be done before um, most of the time focusing on pre-primary objectives does the job it's like sometimes when i came back from from my uh, over years break and I looked at the missions and I looked at all the mission descriptions it, it was difficult to, to even remember like what's the difference between grind them down no prisoners and bring them down uh, or bring it down or something like this and it was also difficult to to focus on you know how to play the game I picked space wolves I never knew whether I should focus on holding the middle or not uh, you know there were I wanted to score as much from primary as possible, so I would usually spread out, which probably wasn't the best because my enemies usually took advantage of that. 
Truth be told, for the majority of missions, if you focus on your objective in your deployment, the middle one, if there is one, and the one that is close to your deployment, that should most of the time do the trick because uh, mo it, the missions usually require you to hold your objective if there is one in your deployment. Uh, one close because the game wants you to, to, to hold one or more, two or more, sometimes three or more, and then more than your opponent. So if you pick just two and stick to them plus the middle one, if you get your opponent off the middle one and take control of it yourself, so three, you already have stranglehold, you already have uh, domination and so on, so that should be enough. Of course, if your army is strong, if you're playing Tyranids, you, you probably don't need this video, but still, if you play a strong army, you of course can spread out, you can go for more objectives. But if you go, if you like read into the wordings of the missions, very often it says that three is enough to score you two points, and then four points uh, come when you hold your enemy's objective in their deployment. Which, you know, if you're there already, you are dominating the game probably. So usually three is enough to be successful. <laughs> and remember, and this is, I cannot stress this enough. Um, it's extremely important. Remember that the game has five turns. However dumb and however simple this may sound, it's actually extremely important because when you plan your game, when you plan your movements out, your, your, you know, how you're going to do actions, how you are going to use your units, um, you need to plan for whole five turns. Um, <laughs> and I've had hundreds, well, hundreds, tens of games where, for example, I played very aggressively even in the first turn, or my long fangs came down in a drop pod in, in the very first turn, and I lost them. And what then? If they failed to, 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 to perform, if they failed to do what I wanted to do, that was probably game. So remember and plan for five turns. Don't go and throw away your units unless you brought throwaway units that can trade well. We will talk about that in a moment. But in general, um, try to evenly spread it out so that you do something in every round and you don't have to worry about what comes at the end. So try, try to maybe, you know, um, play conservatively at times uh, to just have something that will be uh, able to score you points in the last rounds of the game. Moving on. So playing the primary mission, some general thoughts. First of all, uh, playing the primary boils down to three, probably more. You can you can tell me if it's more or not, but playing the uh, the primary boils down, according to me, to three important things. The first one is control. It's again very simple, no surprises there. Um, but you can obtain control over objectives in a couple of ways. First of all, it's through opsec and having opsec. And again, in my list building episode, I mentioned a bunch of times how you can. Uh, make sure that your OPSEC is there, um, you know, by planning the or building your list in the right way, but also maybe you have some shenanigans to take away OPSEC from someone, or, uh, you know, the general realization of how OPSEC works, that you only need one model with OPSEC and then 10 other models to have 11 OPSEC models on the objective. That's actually how OPSEC functions now. So, uh, you know, observe what your opponent does with his OPSEC and what then then you can adjust what you do with your OPSEC. So at the stage, like when you are uh, already um, deploying, look at what your opponent does. Ask your opponent who has OPSEC because sometimes it's obvious, like if you're playing Tau, then you, know, you will know that, you know, the crew probably have OPSEC. But if you're playing Space Marines, it could be that the troops have OPSEC, but it could be that there is a, a character that gives an aura uh, of OPSEC, and then suddenly, you know, out of nowhere, you have Vanguard Vets that have OPSEC on the objective, which might uh, catch you by surprise if you didn't realize that before. So yeah, so observe what your uh, opponent does, how he deploys. You will also know if he deploys, excuse me, certain units closer to the objective, for example, it already tells you that he will try to go and capture that. Um, so you can plan ahead, you can plan uh, you know, how to deploy your units to get there ahead of him or to get your OPSEC units on the same objective. And you can already assume, hmm, I'm going to have more than he does. 
I'm going to score this objective, I'm going to steal it away from him. Or if you have um, certain models that, for example, arrive late on the battlefield. So again, gene stealer cults have that, or Tyranids have that, like a Moloch, for example, that has that ca that could five, that, sorry, could count as five models on an, on an objective. Um, if you see that your opponent just leaves one uh, objective secure, weak troop unit on an objective, you already know that your Moloch could appear there, steal that objective, and you would score points and deny your opponent points, which is also extremely important. Uh, the second aspect of playing the primary game, again, nothing really um, crazy here, but the staying power. Again, I mentioned that during uh, my previous episode, that you need to figure out how your units are going to stay on the battlefield, how they are going to survive on the objective until the next turn. And there are multiple ways you can do that. So, uh, you know, you can lock yourself in combat. So bring units that can go into combat, maybe make someone fight last, kill him, you know, surround a unit. Um, you don't have to fight with every single model in your unit, uh, but you can you can fight with just a couple, kill just the right amount, then surround the enemy, allow him to kill one or two of your models, then, you know, stay around him. You are on the objective, you have more models than your opponent does, it's your objective. Um, you could hide behind terrain or use the terrain to your advantage. If you're playing player place terrain, perhaps you can place the terrain in such a way that it hides the objective from your opponent. So that's an opportunity. Or, as I said, those late arrival units that will survive longer because they appear longer, uh, sorry, appear later. So um, that is also an option that you can take into account that counts towards the staying power on the objective because you can steal objectives like in later turns third for example you can suddenly appear uh, in your opponent's deployment zone because he, you know he neglected the fact that you have units that come from reserves or something uh, that happens very often that the, the the opponent just moves his entire force to um, up to the well up front uh, and leaves only a small unit behind if you're playing an army that has that opportunity to drop to you know, charge onto an objective, for example, that's fantastic, and you should always use that to your advantage to deny uh, the primary points to your opponent. Sometimes denying is even more important than scoring, at times. Uh, the trading power, that's the third aspect of playing the primary game. So when you plan, when, well, that, that probably happens when you choose your faction, but also when you uh, build your, um, your list, you should take into consideration how well your army trades and when you're picking your secondaries in the future, how well your army trades with your opponent. So can you, for example, send a cheap unit that will kill well, score you primary points, and then it will die. If the unit costs 60 points, 70 points, 80 points, that's a, a, a unit that trades well. So it does a lot of damage and it dies. But that's fine, because it's its its purpose. It's supposed to die, but before it dies, it scores your primary. So does your army have this potential? How can you use it to your advantage? Those would be the three uh, points of consideration for the, for the primary mission. Now, specifically, primary missions, how to distinguish them, how to know what they are about, like really quickly. Of course, you can read them during the tournament, but that's probably a little bit too late. So again, do your research, read uh, the mission descriptions, check the maps, and check potential terrain layouts. I will try to show you that in a moment if OBS, <laughs> OBS doesn't, uh, doesn't fail me. So first mission that we talk about is recover the relics. So what, we, what do we need to know about this mission and how can you prepare to play that primary? Um, first of all, CPs depend on controlling markers in opponent's territory. Um, important thing, remember that there is a distinction between opponent territory and opponent deployment zone. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that the territory is basically half of the table. So uh, you need, there are three objectives that count, uh, count towards that. So um, try to remember that when planning and remember that you only score CPs when you control uh, at least one of those markers which could be very important and could affect your playstyle because there are armies that are very CP heavy. If you, for some reason, invested 
or plan to invest a lot of CPs into a certain army composition, a certain combo, certain something, um, you might run out of, of those CPs really quickly. And then if your army fails to secure those objectives in your opponent's um, territory, you might run out of those really quickly and you will have a bad time. Uh, it, this one is really a, a killing mission. So um, think of synergies among the secondaries that work well with that, meaning uh, things like no prisoners, bring it down, Titan Hunter, whatever your opponent is bringing. So that one, uh, one objective probably uh, should be reserved for what your, your uh, opponent has. Um, but yeah, but you can focus on killing because this mission is what this is about. Uh, here, controlling the table is key. So obviously the, the CP generation happens when you control the table. So um, look for synergies there uh, that, that come from table control. So engage on all fronts. It's fairly easy to get stranglehold in here, in here, although be careful because there are three objectives in your deployment zone or in, or in your sorry, in your territory, not your deployment zone, but your opponent has the exactly same thing. So just holding three will not be enough because stranglehold is about three or more, right? So you not only have to score your three, but also deny him his three. So it might take some effort to actually do that. Bear in mind that there is also nothing in the center of the battlefield. So any uh, secondaries, that require you to be in the center of the battlefield, wholly within, within, casting powers within the center of the battlefield and so on. I don't know if these are perfect for this mission because if you think about it, maybe you don't really want to be in the center of the, of the battlefield. There are no objectives there, so you are sending an unprotected unit to do something in the center of the field. Um, I don't think it's that, that's the best choice for this mission. So if you can choose something else, probably that is the right way to go. Um, this also is, if you look at the deployment, it's the, the narrow deployment. So you might want to storm the center. Although, as I said, there isn't really anything to score over there. So maybe it is worth splitting up in this particular scenario. So send half of your army to the left, half of the army to the right. Um, you know, your opponent will then have to react because if he decides to throw everything on one side, he will be dominated on the other side. That's why, as I said uh, earlier, you need to observe what your opponent does and somehow react. But you can also be the one, if you start deploying first, you can start, you know, deploy one unit on the left, one unit on the right. This will already make your opponent think, um, you know, how do I want to play this out? Do you want to split my forces or do I want to throw everything in one direction, focus on the three objectives, you know, on the left or on the right or something like that. So, uh, so there are a lot of things to consider, but remember, pay close attention to what your opponent does in deployment. I've seen many a time when people come to the, um, to the table with a plan, which is always good, but then the execution of the plan, um, is not perfect because the, the, the plan assumes I'm going to deploy in this way. And they don't look what the opponent does. They just count units that they have on the table. And how many, how many have you got? Four. Okay. That's my fourth, uh, third and fourth, for example, without really checking what the opponent does, make sure that you walk around the table, you go to your opponent's uh, deployment zone. You see from your opponent's perspective, how he deploys his army and where, where are the units with OPSEC? Where are the heavy hitters? Where are the, the units that he probably wants to hide? Uh, where are the units that are his to the last if he's taking them? Um, it, it, it makes perfect sense to, to just go to your opponent's uh, deployment zone and have a look how he deploys and then maybe adjust and react to it. Important, know the difference as I have between territory and deployment. So it's very easy to, uh, to misread uh, the primary objective. Remember that uh, it's about scoring in the opponent's territory in order to be successful with this mission. Now, um, let me see if I can show you something. I need to find my mouse first because uh, I have too many screens, I mean, too many, just two screens, but the mouse uh, disappeared and I don't know where it is. Oh, there it is. Uh, let me see if I can show you. something. I don't think I am. So now I am. 
so that's recover the relics. So, okay, uh, recover the, rel the relics would look like this. Now I'll show you um, a, uh, a table, a WTC table, like, for example, this one, this is for mission 11. So, So this is what a table for uh, WTC table for this mission could look like, right? So you need to, are you actually seeing this? Yes, you are, great. So uh, this is what it looks like. As you can see, the two objectives on the left and on the right are, are fairly easy to control. So make sure that you take advantage of that. But then again, remember that it's about taking or removing your opponent from his uh, objective as well, because it's as easy for him to score as it is as it is for you. So um, yeah, something to take into account. And then, as I said, there's nothing in the center of the table, so you might want to skip the center of the table if you have any long-range units that can shoot. Perhaps it's good to line up in such a way that you can shoot through here when your opponent is crossing the table. A lot depends on what army playstyles you're playing. If you're playing a, um, um, like a, a, a close combat army or a ranged army and so on and so on. But yeah, in general, a bunch of things to, to pay attention to. Let's get back to the, to the presentation. Where did it go? Give me a second, I'm doing something wrongly. Hmm. Let me remove this. Okay, back to the presentation. So uh, that's recover the relics. Let's now move to tear down their icons. So the second one, as you can see here, we have the diagonal uh, uh, deployment zones and we have five uh, objectives. So what to take into consideration when we play this army, uh, sorry, this uh, mission, uh, when we talk about the primary, first of all, um, uh, in this mission you have something like priming objectives. For priming objectives is an action and now we get to the point where we start having missions where you have to do actions. Doing an action Usually, unless you have some special powers, special stratagems, special abilities, um, doing actions really turns off your unit until the end of this round, unless it can, you know, it is within charging range of something. But if you do an action, usually you cannot cast spells, usually you cannot shoot. So it's good to bring action monkeys. This is also something that I mentioned in our list building episode uh, last week, that... I was scolded once by Vladi. I was playing against a game against Pumba, and uh, I I was playing my Tyranids, but before the Codex was released, and I built an army where I had only the powerhouses. I had you know the Hive Guard. I had uh, whatever uh, Gene Stealers. I, I think it was a mix of like Gene Stealer cults and Tyranids. So I had only units that did damage. It was an extremely strong army when it comes to raw fighting, shooting power. But it didn't have the Unction Monkeys. So what happened was my units that were supposed to actually deal damage had to sit back and had to score, um, well, do actions which was a waste of time, it was a waste of their potential, some of them died while doing it, so make sure that when you build your list, when you prepare for the mission, be it a primary or secondary, because secondary missions have a lot of actions as well, that you bring those, let's call them redundant units, maybe not redundant, but uh, units that are something like throwaway units, those chaff units, that will do your actions for you, uh, and you don't have to sacrifice your strong units because the strong units are there to do completely different things and it would be a shame for them to be wasted on performing actions. Um, the priming objective thing could be either completely ignored because you can, you can play your mission successfully without doing it, or uh, if you prime the objective, make sure that you stay around because uh, if, if an objective is primed, 
and your opponent wants to defuse it, he can only do that if you are not within range of that objective. It's somewhat similar to banners. If somebody wants to take off the banner from, from an objective, firstly, you need to be gone from that objective. It, it's the same here. So, um, so either ignore this mission and just do your thing, or if you want to play to the mission and you want to prime those objectives, those, yeah, those, um, let's call them explosives, uh, then uh, stay around to make it even harder for your opponent to, uh, to remove them or to defuse them. Again, remember that when you when it's about priming objectives and those explosives, it's within your enemy enemy's territory, not deployment. So if you look at the at the mission, if you look at the map in here, it's very close from your deployment to your enemy's territory. Um, so you might want to take a unit that moves, I don't know, ten inches, twelve inches, if you have such, and then you can appear in uh, in your uh, opponent's territory and just do it. And then you know take uh, or maybe distract him somehow so he doesn't get to that explosive, and uh, and you will score points. So yeah, something to take into account. Again, like with the majority of missions with five objectives, focusing on three objectives usually does the job. So pick a triangle, like for example this one. So your objective, the middle objective, or the central objective, and the one that is close to your deployment. And uh, that's enough. That will allow you to score stranglehold. Uh, that will allow you to score more than your opponent if you can ensure that in every single uh, round that you play, you can remove him from the center. So um, focusing on three should be enough. If your army is strong enough, if it has enough resilient, strong, shooty, fighty units, you can focus on more. But um, if you want to play the minimum, if you want to do the minimum, focus on the minimum, then your objective, the one close to your deployment, and the central one should be enough. Um, and yeah, uh, one important thing, if you read, I'm not, not reading the, the, the missions exactly because I assume that at this point a lot of people have read them, know them, you have access to chapter approved, you can check, but what I want to draw your attention to is the OPSEC uh, um, word in uh, the description of this mission because OPSEC units, and that's a fact for the majority of primaries and majority of secondaries, OPSEC units complete missions faster. So um, if you have your OPSEC units doing those missions, you will be more successful. That's why I said earlier that it is really important to take into consideration whether you have OPSEC in your army and uh, um, how does it affect mission scoring. Um, I don't think I'm going to go into uh, into Tabletop Simulator because I, I haven't mastered the switching between the images yet. Uh, so once I have another screen, I will probably be able to show you something like that. It was an ambitious plan, I'm sorry. But uh, let's move on with the presentation. Uh, so the next one, Data Scry Salvage. So you can see this is a six objective uh, mission. Important things to, to consider. Uh, First of all, you need to have something on your objective at all times uh, because that's what the mission assumes. Uh, and the second thing that so many people forget is sticky objectives. I've been to many tournaments where I've seen how people you know, stick to their objectives, leave units on, on, on the objectives, even when the objectives are not in danger of being actually captured just because they forget that the objectives in this mission are sticky if you have an OPSEC unit. So if, if your unit that had ob ob objective secured was on the objective, it remains yours even if you leave the objective. That's extremely important for scoring. That's extremely important for the freedom of movement, freedom of actions, freedom of whatever you want. So make everything that is possible not to forget that the objectives are sticky and that um, basically uh, they remain under your control even, even if you go off them. Again, a reminder about territory and not deployment. And uh, like before, uh, three objectives in a triangle and fighting for them usually should do the trick if you can take your, your opponent off the objective. Because scoring stranglehold on six objectives a mission is highly dependent on... Um, on, on how successfully you can remove your opponent from his uh, um, objectives. So here, 
if you want to take strangle and if you want to score the primary, uh, you probably need to spread out to be able to have a fight on the other end of the, of the, of the table while also uh, focusing on your three objectives. Um, and yeah, this is a domination type of mission. So the more you hold, the more points you get to a maximum of three. But you cannot forget that the objectives are sticky. So uh, OPSEC, again, crucial for this mission. Next one, Abandoned Sanctuaries. This is a Dawn of War style mission. Um, to be perfectly honest, we don't, I, maybe I'm, I'm mistaken, but I haven't seen those being played a lot at Polish tournaments. I think uh, mainly because uh, Dawn of War, no, I, actually, I don't know why. I thought that this was because of like WTC uh, requirements and so on. Maybe Pumba or someone will correct me. But uh, when you look at the mission packs and the rules packs for tournaments in Poland, th those Dawn of War missions don't get played very much. Even like when we play our TTS leagues and so on, you don't very see those maps very often. But still, in any other circumstances, you would play it. So let's let's have a look at those. This is the mission where you can only deploy in your deployment zone. You cannot really drop anything in the no man's land, uh, so the NML, um, which is a bummer if you're bringing units like Striking Scorpions or my um, Vanguard Deployment Broodlord or Gene Stealers, which aren't very popular, but I still like to do that. So this mission blocks you or for, forbids you. Um, or, well, um, yeah, you, you cannot simply do this in this mission, which means that it's more difficult to get to objectives. It's more difficult to score them. Uh, and this means that you, in, in this mission, you have to fight for the center. Like in the majority of missions where you have five objectives, you have to run to the center. Uh, usually, as I said, it's the easiest is to pick like a triangle of uh, objectives and stick to that triangle. So you, you have your deployment zone one, you have one on the left or on the right, and the center one. That's probably... Uh, the safest bet, unless you have your little action monkeys, you have your little quick units. Again, when you deploy, pay close attention because the deployment is really, really wide. So um, pay close attention to what your opponent does in that deployment, because if they s tend to lean towards one side of the deployment, if you see that they put like third or fourth unit on one side and nothing on the other side, that could mean that they are planning to focus just on this half of the table and then maybe, you know, putting like a quick or fight unit on the other side of the table could let you score that objective more reliably. Um, so yeah, so so in this mission, you, you either castle up, you know, somewhere in the middle and then spread out, or you choose to split. And uh, also when you deploy, then you, you can play those mind games with your opponent. So uh, yeah, make your opponent spread out as well important thing is to pay attention to what your opponent does in this mission. Um, this will tell you his intentions to an extent. Yeah. Okay. Conversion. Uh, in this mission, again, you have three objectives in no man's land, one in your deployment zone. And in this mission, you only score, you only get CP, uh, this, this extra CP when your warlord is alive. So, Pay close attention to where your warlord is, what he does. He could be in a transport, I think the rule says. But most importantly, don't sacrifice your warlord, you know, easily. Even when you're playing like Tyranids and you make your um, your winged hive tyrant with Re Reaper of Obliterax, um, um, he's your warlord. Just don't treat him as a as a throwaway unit because um, again, if your army is CP reliant you are effectively denying yourself the CP by sacrifice, sacrificing him turn one. And remember, specifically for Tyranid, uh, you can use Overrun, but you cannot use um, Encircle the Prey. You cannot really leave the table after fighting now. So if you are unlucky, if you misroll your attacks or you know don't use rerolls or for wounds and you don't kill your target, you stay on the table. And if he dies, uh, the CPs go away with him. Uh, always have something on your own objective. That's 
crucial for this mission. Um, and yep, yeah, by the by the mission description, it says that you score two points if you hold at least one objective in no man's land, and you score four if you score uh, your opponent's objective. I wouldn't focus on the last bit, the the four points for your opponent's um, objective, unless either you are dominating the game already, or you have some shenanigans to steal his objective mid-game, like appear, you know, from deep strike very close on the objective, or uh, steal the objective somehow by maybe like save charges if you can charge on the 3d6 or something with an objective secured unit, then by all means um, use it and, and and focus on those four points. But if you don't have those tools, then uh, it's enough to hold just one objective in no man's land to score two points, and you should be doing that every round. So you don't have to overextend, just focus on one. If you took Stranglehold three tops, but it should be sufficient. And the, yeah, the center objective is also in no man's land, that's the most important bit. Um, and again, the rule of the triangle, so choose three that are closest to the, 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 for Stranglehold, for example, and three will also be usually more than your opponent in those cases because there are only five. The scouring, as you can see, all uh, objectives are in no man's land and very close to one another. So, or like the, the side objectives and the middle objective are very close to each other. Um, this is about scanning the objectives. So the more you scan, the more points you get, which is an action as well. Um, Again, my advice is to focus on three objectives. None of them is your is in your deployment zone, so you can move freely around the table, but you can either choose the ones closer to your deployment zone and the middle ones, or just choose a flank and dominate that flank. Um, in your deployment, you can again play those mind games with your opponent, spread, go on th two flanks. Um, if you want to choose, uh, like, I don't know, Space Marines and Oath of Moment, if you want to choose the primary objective, then make sure that the, the, the center objective is part of your triangle, and that's it. Fight for the middle, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's that's it about the mission. Uh, nothing crazy here. Uh, I will mention some stuff in the secondary section about this mission as well, but really, there's nothing more to it. It's hard to be original at this stage <laughs> when we talk about missions when everyone has been playing them for such a long, long time, and new missions are coming soon. Um, but yeah, remember that they are not very far away. So again, by using your movement, using your pylons, consolidations, charges, and so on, you can easily encompass at least three of those objectives. Um, Tide of Conviction. I played that recently against Vitalis and his knights. Uh, if the planets align well enough, we shall have a battle report really soon uh, that w with this particular um, deployment in this particular mission. So basically, this is a fairly this is a mission that um, uh, encourages a fairly aggressive playstyle because uh, what you need to do is, is is to control the objectives in your opponent's territory. Territory again, half of the table. It doesn't have to be his deployment, but it should be in his half. So there are three objectives in his territory, and you should get to them. Uh, as soon as possible to score mission points, to score primary points, and defend yours at the same time. So one more time, because this is a, like a very wide dawn of war deployment. Observe what your um, what your opponent does. How he like if he plays knights and he has or chaos knights and he has two big ones and the small ones. If the big ones are ganking up on one side of the table, it should be a clear information that he probably will be focusing on that side of the table. Um, but at the same time, remember that the small guys have OPSEC, they move like 14 inches or 12 inches or something like that. So on this deployment, they can get to your um, to your objectives really quickly. So make sure that you have enough of your units close to those objectives with OPSEC, with the right amount of, of units to not have the, those uh, objectives stolen from you. This is what actually happened when we were playing Vitalis. So this right objective over here, there was a ruin, like a little triangle ruin, uh, and I had my Hormagant behind this ruin, but only one of them was on the objective. I didn't ask how far his um, his little 
Hubbard, no, Hubbard, Armiger can go. So it turned out that um, he could go, come to my deployment, steal that from me because he had OPSEC as five units. Uh, my single Hormagant wasn't enough to provide to, to you know, with, with my OPSEC wasn't enough to uh, to keep that objective on my end and he stole that one from me. So I didn't score as much or as many points as I wanted um, in my next uh, round. So yeah, that's a, a valid point as well. I always ask your opponents about ranges that they have, ranges of shooting, ranges of movement. Uh, you know, um, how far they can charge, do they have any dice that allow them to charge more and so on, because you need to be careful how far you deploy, how far you move, etc, etc. Do your research. Uh, again, uh, even though in here uh, the objectives are fairly easily reachable, um, don't go crazy and don't overextend. Um, Especially, like for example, in the in the game that I played, if I overextended to his table half too quickly, he could use that to his advantage. Or, uh, like I, I used to play, I, I played a a guy who played um, Dark Angels and his Terminators. If you overextend against an army like that on a table like this one, uh, the slow Terminators will actually become very quick because they will charge you and that could be like seven inches, then they pile in three, so it's 10 inches, then they kill you, <laughs> then they consolidate, that's another three or even more if they have specific rules. So that's already 13 inches handed over to someone as a gift because you misplaced your units. So don't overextend, shoot for as much as you can, cast your spells for as much as you can, let them come to you and then retaliate or then you know, attack them when they are close. You don't have to score the maximum points in every single round. You need to score, or you need to make sure that your score is higher than your opponent's, obvious thing, but still uh, at the end of the game. But you don't have to score 12 every single round. You don't have to score max out of your secondaries every single time. At the end, you know, probably if you want to win a tournament, you know, be on the top tables at all times, finish in the top eight or something, you probably should. But if you don't have that ambition or if you're on your way there, take it easy. The game has five turns, you know, um, pace yourself, basically. Um, yeah, and in this mission, it's it's not very hard to have control over three objectives. So um, if you play this right, you should have those eight points or at any time. Um, and then for Stranglehold, either catch one more objective or remove your opponent from his objective. And a lot on, in this mission will depend on the terrain as well, because if the objectives are well hidden, uh, you might use this to your advantage but so might your opponent. So again, depends what kind of tournament you are playing in. Death and Zeal, so another mission with the circle in the center. Um, don't forget that this mission is also about sticky, sticky objectives, which means your objective secured units play a pivotal role in this one. Um, the objectives are fairly far away from, our, from, from one another. But if you want to keep it simple, if you want to ensure that you don't um, spread out too much, focus on just three objectives and pick secondaries that also focus on just three objectives. Um, you could, if your army allows, focus on four objectives. So the middle one and the two in no man's, uh, no man's land. This will score you two points from engage on all fronts, for example. It is an option. You can do that. Depends on what your army can do and depends on what your enemy can do, but we will get to the secondaries in a moment. Um, in this mission, you are supposed to either, so you score points either for uh, taking a new objective or removing someone who was controlling an objective. So again, the center objective is probably going to be the one that you're going to be battling for the most. But again, if we talk about 2000 points, games, there's a lot of stuff going on the table. It could be that the opponent will come for uh, the mm, objective in your territory. So you need to observe how they deploy. Do they deploy close to their, their like deployment zone lines or, or something like that? This will indicate where they more or less want to go. 
also the terrain will will uh, define where they want to go. So again, make sure that when you deploy, you walk to your opponent's zone and see, um, you know, where they deploy their units, how they deploy their units, um, what their potential movements could be, what their game plan could be. You can sort of read that from your opponent's deployment if you just walk around the table and look at the table from their perspective. This will also help you to understand whether they can see your units or not, or like what are the, you know, the shooting alleys that they are going for that you probably should stay away from. So it, it could be very eye-opening to just go to the other side of the table and take a look from the like eyes of your opponent. Um, the, the mission is about killing. So pick killing secondaries and synergies. And uh, yeah, fighting for the middle often satisfies the requirements of the mission in this one. So it's, yeah. I think that's the last one, secure missing artifacts. So uh, that's the one where you reposition your objectives. I mean, you reposition objectives in general. So um, again, you, if you're player A, you move one, then your opponent moves two, and then you move one again. Um, if it if if you don't start, then it your opponent does that, and you get to move to in the middle. So um, you can you can use this to either keep your objective safe, so you can pull it like deeper into your deployment, so it's harder for your opponent to get to, or you can pick his his uh, objective and move it closer to the center of the table. For example, this means that probably when it's his turn, he's going to do the same to you. So you get to choose whether you want to play a safer game by moving your objective deeper, or that whether you want to play a more aggressive game, for example, and be able to reach his objective by pulling it a little bit closer to the center. Uh, again, focus on three objectives to make it simple. That is, that's something that I will be repeating for all five objective games. And that's actually it. So those are the primary um, missions, or, or whatever the missions focus on in, in the primary. Now some general thoughts about secondary missions. So I cannot stress it enough, list building and secondaries intertwine. You should be thinking about secondaries when you design your list. Important point, take agency away from your opponent as much as possible when it comes to secondaries. What do I mean by that? I mean, try to pick secondaries that your opponent cannot affect. So, for example, when I used to play my Space Wolves, um, their codex or supplement objectives are, one is that you choose your enemy's warlord or character that you issue a challenge to, and then that model needs to accept the challenge and you need to kill that model, basically. If you choose that, you, you, you hand this over to your opponent, your opponent just keeps that character hidden, keep, keeps him far away, <laughs> you don't score it. Uh, the, there was one uh, where you need to either charge two units during a turn, or you need to be in combat uh, with two units during a turn. Again, you know, <laughs> your opponent could just stay away from you and try to shoot you off the table for as many rounds as possible and denying you points. Don't choose objectives like that. Don't choose objectives where your opponent can decide whether you score them or not. So uh, be very careful about that because there are multiple objectives that could, or multiple secondaries, that could lose you points if you hand them over to your opponent. Try to focus on those that don't depend on your opponent's decision very much. Consider unit sizes and types. So I mentioned this back in uh, the list building episode. Certain secondaries have specific wordings that only a specific kind of unit can do them. So it's either infantry or a biker or uh, a character um, or a unit of three or a, you know there is like a retrieve Nachman data where you need to roll a die and then subtract one. And if you choose a unit that has only a single model or three models, it could mean that you don't score this objective and that's a wasted turn. So I had that when I played uh, my Tyranids on the old codex with a unit of three warriors, for example. Uh, I think I was playing Crusher Stampede back then and I chose R&D. 
and my three warriors would run to 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 uh, to, to another quarter of the table. I said, I'm doing r and I rolled the die, and I rolled a number. That, I think it was a five, so I didn't score it. And then, as we were playing on TTS, and TTS can do that to you at times, it happened three times in a row, or three turns in a row, where my warriors wouldn't score that bloody secondary. So don't make that mistake. Um, only choose R&D, for example, if you have units that are of five or bigger, um, because this ensures that it, it's done automatically. So uh, take those things into consideration. While preparing your list, be wary of how many points you give up. This cannot be stressed enough. Uh, there, are, Sometimes you are very, um, like, you, you need many characters in your list, for example, but then, you know, it could mean that you give up 15 points from assassination and the characters are squishy. So, you know, maybe not, that's not the best choice of a, a uh, of an army composition or when you, I don't know, uh, you, you give up a lot of points from, uh, from bringing it down because you have too many vehicles, stuff like that. So just be careful, think whether you can deny uh, those secondaries to your opponent. Maybe you cannot deny them completely, but if you can decrease the amount of points that they score and, you know, it, it's hard for them to make a decision, whether it should be bring it down or no prisoners or mm, a port of wedge or something like that because all of them give out like eight points it's already a good thing because it confuses the opponent he needs to think harder while you come with your prepared list of objectives that you know that your army can score maybe that's the way to go uh, careful about traps and misconceptions now this is a big one uh, this is something that uh, many people get caught off guard by for example, and I, I gave those examples on the slide, one of them is Abhor the Witch. Um, if you play an army without this hiker, you can pick Abhor the Witch. That's in the rules, that's understandable. But sometimes people consider this an auto pick when they play a heavy, a hiker heavy army. Let's say Grey Knights, okay, fairly doable, but then uh, Thousand Suns. And now if you think about the composite, the typical Thousand Sons army composition. That is usually an army that consists of what two ten man Terminator bricks. Now, if you tell me that this is easy to remove, I will laugh at you <laughs> because it's not. And you can defy your sorry, um, well, lose points in this one if you assume that you can kill anything in that list easily. Mm -mm. Uh, you cannot. The same goes for, like, I know it's not probably top of the meta right now, but like, uh, uh, Grey Knights with a lot of baby carriers, three of them at least used to be Grandmasters, not so easy to kill. So uh, don't go, you know, don't, don't fall into that trap that, ah, he has all, all the psychers, I'm just going to take up Horde, because it might turn out that you cannot really score uh, that that secondary. Same goes for Assassinate. Danny, who is an exceptional GSC player, uh, when we played in one of the TTS leagues, uh, you know, he brought a list that had like, I don't know, five or six characters. So, you know, the color morph, the, that's all the names I can remember, uh, but, <laughs> but basically a lot of them. And to me, Assassinate seemed like an auto pick. And Danny even said, be careful, because my characters aren't that easy to kill. Um, I didn't listen. I picked Assassinate also because I, I don't think at that time I had a better secondary to pick. So I went with Assassinate and I only scored three points because his Keller Morth appeared really close to me and I managed to kill them. The rest of the guys usually stayed far, far away. I lost the game. This secondary didn't give me points because his characters were simply unkillable for me. So again, the sheer fact that someone brings a lot of characters doesn't mean that assassinate is easy to do. So consider how well those characters can be hidden, consider whether they start off the table and when they can appear on the table. If they come on the table turn three, that's already two turns of you not killing characters. So uh, that could be a trap that it's very easy to fall into. Uh, psychic objectives. First of all, you need to remember to do them because uh, at times it so happens that, uh, I don't know, sacking interrogation, you took it, but 
you forgot to do it because each psyker has a spell that is of value and you want to cast that spell and only when you're done casting your spells you're like oh shit i didn't do psychic interrogation ah god damn it don't do that or don't fall into that trap but also uh, my piece of advice, if you can, if your army allows it, if you have cheap psychers, for example, bring that one redundant psyker that can, uh, you know, come and serve only this purpose. Then it's easier to remember, if you have trouble remembering, it's easier to remember that you have to do, for example, psychic interrogation because um, there is this one guy who doesn't have any meaningful spells, he's only there to... Uh, to cast psychic interrogation, for example, and remember, psychic interrogation doesn't need line of si sorry doesn't need line of sight. Uh, it can be cast from 24 inches away, which means that this one redundant psyker could stay fairly safe and still cast uh, or well do this action. But yeah, but you don't want to um, invest your psychers that have those valuable spells into doing psychic missions, for example. Um, also, in the missions where you don't have um, a primary objective at, in the center of the table, uh, picking psychic secondaries where you have to be close to the, to the table center in order to do a mission, if you bring more than just a psychic to the center, fine. If you don't, if you don't, don't plan on doing that, probably it's a bad secondary pick. So also something to to keep in mind. There are certain traps that you can fall into. Uh, it, it even happens that you choose, like, I don't know, bring it down because the opponent has a lot of vehicles, but then, I don't know, you didn't bring uh, a lot of strength 8, strength 9, or stronger weapons. And it turns out that killing your opponent is actually harder than you thought. And you might not score as many points as you assumed you would. So careful with that. Throwaway units, what I mentioned earlier. So throwaway casters, but also those throwaway units that can maybe trade well or can just go, score an, score an objective and then die or something like that, score a secondary and then die. So um, back in the day, uh, servitors were uh, epic. I don't know if people still pick them. I haven't seen them for a while, but you know, my Tyranids list always has a unit of, of, uh, of Horma counts, for example, just because they are quick, just because they can jump on an objective, they have OPSEC. Um, so, so something like that. So you don't uh, regret using them, but you also don't regret losing them. Look for synergies with the mission. So if you read that the, 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 the the primary, the second part of the primary reads that you are supposed to kill, probably it's it's worth taking secondaries that also focus on killing, uh, or abhor the witch or something like that. If you're playing against an army that, um, where things need to die anyway. If you need to control the table, probably the secondaries that like engage on all fronts or stranglehold uh, are good secondaries because they are again a synergy to the primary mission. So when you read the primary start already thinking what your secondaries could be. Uh, fun with to the last. So to the last uh, is a two sentence objective. Uh, if you if you read it, people usually focus on the first one, which is um, you score five points if the unit survives. But then there is the second sentence as well, uh, which men mentions units that split into a bunch. Uh, and this is something that I've discovered a couple of weeks ago. Uh, about carnifexes. If you take three carnifexes in a unit and you put them on the table, they start behaving as a single unit, sorry, as, as, as three separate units, but for the purposes of to the last, all of them need to be killed for the points to be denied. And even though if one of them dies and two stay alive, or two of them die and one stays alive, you only score three points, Still, if your opponent opponent wants to deny you those five points, you need to kill th all three of them, which might be extremely difficult if you play the game right. So squadrons have another little advantage to them that uh, to the last score is a little bit differently on them. So consider maybe building your army in such a way that you bring your expensive squadron and then you know spread out so your opponent has a tougher time killing those guys. Um, remember that uh, nowadays the rules state that
that uh, two mission, two secondaries need to be picked from the GT book, and only one can be taken from the codex or from the supplement. So um, if your army, like the Dark Angels one, where you just sit on an objective and you score automatically score 15, or uh, I don't know anything else like the Dark Elder one, where you score uh, points when your opponent is not in a certain table quadrant. Uh, those are good secondaries from the codex, but as I said, they are in the minority. So if you have such objectives that you consider good, or I don't know, you play Space Wolves and you want to play aggressive and you want to charge and be in combat every single turn, then bring your uh, uh, codex secondary, but only one. And then be very careful uh, which category that secondary is from, because it's very easy to overlap a category, for example, because usually the, the secondary that you want to pick is in, is in the popular secondary category, and you cannot have two from one category. So don't make that mistake. I have <laughs> a couple of times. Um, playing the secondary mission, just going really quickly, I'm going to go really quickly through the secondaries and, and talk about like whether they are worth it or whether there are some pitfalls. So assassinate, as the name suggests, suggests kill characters, as I said, could be a pitfall, could be good, depending on how resilient the characters are. If they have a three three up invulnerable um, and your opponent has a lot of infantry around them, probably um, not the best choice. If the opponent has many, you have to assess uh, you know how easy they are to kill. Uh, over the course of the game, you can kill them all, but it depends how efficient your army is against your opponent's army. Uh, whether your opponent can keep them off the table, whether your opponent puts them in transports and so on. So even against Drukari, for example, it's, it's really difficult to kill those characters, Drazar, the Succubus, and so on and so on. Even though they are toughness 3 models, but they have a 4-up invulnerable and they usually move in transports that have a minus 1 to hit. I don't know if Assassinate is the best one to choose. I probably wouldn't go for it. Bring it down. If it's difficult to remember which one this is, bringing down is about killing the big guys, so killing monsters, killing uh, knights, killing vehicles. So again, if you brought the tools to the table to deal with high toughness, high, uh, you know, high wound count models, by all means, pick this up. It's the one to go. Titan Hunter kill titans, uh, obviously. So only in specific contexts this might come in handy. Usually, it's a forgettable one. No mercy, no respite. So no prisoners, as opposed to bring it down. This is about killing the small ones. You need to kill a lot of wounds, uh, and each ten wounds give you grant you uh, one victory point. So you need to kill like 130 wounds to to score 13 points or something like this. So um, this basically is good against hordes, against a lot of infantry units, stuff like that. So it could be a good synergy with. Some other ones, like if you're playing Grey Knights uh, and you want to take up Horde the Witch, then maybe No Prisoners is also a good pick because you will be killing a lot of infantry anyway. To the last, Simply Survive. Again, you pick the three most costly units. Remember about those squadrons and that you can have a little play over there. Um, so that's a good one. Uh, although, like if you're playing knights, for example, obviously the knights will become targets anyway. So to the last might not be the safest pick. But if you have an expensive character that you can hide somewhere behind the ruins, behind terrain in your deployment zone, and he's a, just a buffer or something like that, absolutely, that's a way to go. Grind them down. Simply kill more than your opponent. Could be a trap. Vitalis took that one against me in our last game uh, with his knights. And he wasn't able to score that. I effectively denied that to him. I was more efficient at killing uh, his units, and he, I think he scored it once in five turns only, so that's also a trap. Uh, something that could happen, so it's very easy to underestimate your opponent. Uh, if you're not sure uh, what the damage output of your opponent is, just don't take this one, because it could be a pitfall. Um, hmm, the psychic ones called Warcraft, yeah, so Abhor the Witch, again, could be a good one. There is a limitation, you cannot have a Psyker, and uh, depending on what your arm, your opponent's army composition is, it might be a good pick, it might be a bad pick. Um, sometimes it's simply not worth it because the opponent doesn't have enough. 
of those uh, casters to give you reliable 12 points, for example. Um, Pierce the Veil. Um, I think that's the one where you need to cast something in your in your opponent's deployment zone or close to it. I haven't seen anyone take it, and I don't recommend taking it because the um, the conditions that you need to fulfill to to perform this one are nigh impossible to achieve. You either sacrifice your psychers, or I don't I, I can't imagine a scenario where this one would be good. So if GW wants to consider changing secondaries, I think that's one of the first ones that they should change because nobody ever picks it, and uh, it's just a dangerous one to pick. Uh, so yeah, Warp Ritual casting when you are within six inches of the center. Uh, again, good for missions where you want to have control over the center anyway, and your units will be moving towards the center. Uh, not not a good one where you have like six objectives and none of them is in the center because um, this means that you have to dedicate a certain amount of your forces to go to the center of the table and your cyber as well, which means that they are not fighting in another place where they could be useful, perhaps not the best choice. Psych interrogation, on the other hand, quite a frequent, uh, after the changes, quite a frequent psychic secondary. So you, you perform the psychic action 24 inches away from your opponent, as I said, you don't need line, line of sight, you sort of psychically interrogate them from a distance, from afar. That's really cool, that's really good. Remember that all of those, unfortunately, can be um, dispelled, or they can be, what's the word? You know, your opponent can can simply deny you them if they have a psyker. So, you know, the, the, the denial distance is 24 inches. You do it from 24 inches, which means unless you have some possibility to extend that range, which I don't think you, you, you have, um, there is a danger that they will simply uh, deny you this one uh, with deny the witch. So that's a risk that you're taking when, when you're doing those. If your opponent plays Tau, for example, and they have no means of uh, uh, denying that, then by all means take it. Remember that there are certain units in the game or certain armies that have the possibility to deny a spell on a 4 plus or something like that, like I think sisters. So if you take second interrogation, uh, it's, it's a clear signal to your opponent that he should wait for that one spell and then deny, and this denies you points, so maybe not the best pick. Playing the secondary mission, so we have uh, Shadow Operations now, uh, Raise the Banner High, I really like this one, but it's probably a better choice for those missions where you have six objectives and three in your territory or something like this, because it's fairly easy to, uh, to get to those objectives, to stand on them, to do the missions, uh, sorry, to, to raise the banners, to do the actions. Um, at times it's even good in those ones where you have five objectives because it is something that could potentially reliably score you uh, two points each round. If you hold two objectives and have two, um, I don't know, resilient, survivable OPSEC units on those objectives, your opponent really needs to come, kill those units, remove you from the objective, and only then, if he has more OPSEC than you do, he takes control on the objective and removes the banner. So if you play something like OPSEC Terminators and you can put them on those objectives, they will probably guarantee you certain amount of points throughout the course of the game. If there is nothing better that you can pick, um, you know, you, you, you struggle to, 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 to pick objectives, this is a good one because your resilient units with the OPSEC can just sit there, score those points every single round, and that's it. That's a more passive, more castly, um, if that's a word. Uh, kind of um, approach, but if there is nothing better to choose, because, I don't know, your opponent built his army very well and then you have a tough time picking something else, raise the banners might be the way to go. Um, retrieve Nakman data, also a good one, but remember about those unit sizes. It could be a trap if you have a smaller unit. Um, the role could defy, define whether you score it or not, so if you have bigger units or units of five that will not melt very easily, that is definitely a mission for you to pick. Um, investigate signal. So that's another objective that requires being close to the center of the table. 
as with the psychic ones. Uh, in the mission where you need to hold the center, absolutely yes. In the missions where you, there is no central objective, I will probably forego this one and pick another one. Deploy homers, um, so or de deploy teleport homers. Um, so it depends on uh, your opponent's deployment because you need to be close to it to uh, uh, to do those the, the secondary. I hardly ever pick it, uh, but if you see some application, then absolutely you should go for it. Uh, battlefield supremacy. So behind enemy lines. Um, it, in previous editions, behind enemy lines was was a more reliable one. Nowadays, uh, I think when you pick this one, you deny yourself a, a bunch of points. Um, uh, you cannot really start doing it early in the game, <coughs> only when your opponent moves away. You need to have certain mechanisms to probably safely get to that deployment, and sometimes it's impossible to appear in your opponent's deployment, so I wouldn't really pick this one very often unless your opponent is playing, again, knights, small model count army where it's not so hard to uh, to drop into his deployment zone. Other than that, I don't recommend this one. Engage on all fronts, again, depending on your uh, army playstyle. If you're playing Eldar and your army is quick and you can ensure that they will appear in at least three uh, table quarters uh, in, during a turn and survive, then engage on all fronts is uh, the way to go. If you're playing a, a slow army, uh, probably stranglehold. Hold, so the next one on the list is better for you because you just need to sit on three objectives and that's it. You don't have to be very mobile. You don't have to move a lot. Engage on all fronts. Also remember that, uh, that the rule says or the, the mission says that you need to have a unit of three or a vehicle. So if you have just a single character, you cannot really score it. Um, you need to be like six inches away from the, the, the line of the um, of the quarter. So there are certain caveats that make this uh, mission a little bit harder to do. But it depends. If you have a reliable unit that can do that, like I don't know, a storm speeder, uh, sorry, a land speeder storm, for example, uh, the crazy unit for like 50 points that you can just send to your opponent, uh, hide behind the ruin perhaps, and just sit there. By all means, pick it. That's a perfect unit to do that. Or like if you have a small bike unit or like Eldar bike unit um, that can just go and sit in the uh, uh, in the table quarter. By all means, pick this one. And that's really that's really it. So I wanted to show you the um, the the deployments and terrain in Tabletop Simulator, but it didn't really work that well. I apologize for that. Um, let me know in the comments if your assessment of those secondaries differs. Maybe I got something wrong. Uh, maybe some things could be done in a better way. Um, so, yeah, that's basically it. Um, also, as I said at some point, huge request. We are present on Facebook. We are present on Spotify. We are present on all the podcasting media. And we are on Instagram. If you like what we're doing, if you want more, then please... Uh, let us know either by dropping a comment or liking or subscribing or all of those uh we would be much obliged because it will help us grow um i might have mentioned that we played a game with vitalis recently um we tried to record this game uh we tried to play it in english so uh vitalis is working now he is the new addition to to the contact loss family and he is now fighting <laughs> to uh, create a battle report out of the material that we collected so soon hopefully that will be released to the channel and then uh, on Thursday we will be recording an episode with Pumba as I mentioned at the beginning where we will be discussing Hegemonalia or the uh, Polish team tournament uh, with 18 teams five players a team um, that took place in Warsaw this last weekend uh, a lot of interesting lists, a lot of interesting plays, a lot of interesting gossip as well, uh, and maybe you know some secrets from the Polish national team. So if you find that interesting, by all means, tune in on on Thursday. I think we will try to make it live as well. Although Joker will be the you know the Moon Knight sitting in darkness in his kitchen or something like that. But I know that Pumba is okay with recording live, so we might just do that. Um, so yeah, tune in, and again, let us know if you like what we're doing. 
Okay. I will leave you to it. Thank you for joining if you joined. Thank you for listening if you're on Spotify, if you are uh, watching the recording, not the live um, uh, broadcast. Um, and yeah, until next time. Bye, guys. Thank you.